So this is providing OpenStack high availability through AnyCast routing. Um, my name is Richard Raisley, and I'm a systems operations engineer at Puppet Labs. So before we dive into the topic, I'll just give you a little bit of my background so you know where I'm coming from. Um, I've been involved in IT for about a decade and have had various system administration, engineering, and architecture roles at uh, companies like Concur Technologies and Microsoft. Um, I was fortunate enough to become involved with OpenStack in early 2012 and have been equally fortunate to be able to leverage that into the role I have today, which is thinking about OpenStack and automation and those associated things on a full-time basis. I am also, along with my esteemed friend there, Christopher from Morantis, the uh, co-organizer of the OpenStack PDX user group down in Portland, Oregon. So please stop by if you ever find yourself down that way. Third Thursday of every month. Thank you, Christopher. So here's the big question. Why are we all here? So for many of us, this summit is going to be your first exposure to OpenStack, the technology, and the community. While on the other end of the spectrum, many of you are running large production clouds, and I'm sure there's a lot of places in between. Um, but we're all here because we've all had the same important realization. And that realization is that high availability is important. It's not just important, it's absolutely critical. So hardware and software will fail. They will fail especially at scale. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and in what way. So as we start thinking about our environments and as we start modeling these various scenarios, we have at least one additional realization. And that's high availability is difficult. And it's difficult because in addition to the innate complexities of managing OpenStack and all the components that go along with that, you're now forced to manage an additional software layer, its configuration, and all those associated pieces. So my goal for today is to present an additional option. I just want to give operators and administrators another tool in their belt so when they think about the high availability options out there, they have a wider array of choices. Um, and they can pick the right tool for the right job, which is obviously always the most important thing. So before we get started, I want to give a little buyer beware. Um, you know, the, this is um, technologies that we've run in our lab, and AnyCast itself is really um, not on trial here because it is obviously a very widely used um, and used daily by everyone um, protocol. But um, I thought it in the interest of full transparency to say that we have not tried this at scale. We're not running a large public cloud with this. This is more of a, I guess, uh, academic exercise at this point. So with that, I'm going to jump into the agenda for today. So first, we're going to go ahead and introduce AnyCast. Um, and we're going to talk about what some high-level flows look like in AnyCast and kind of what that, that scenario looks like. Secondly, we're going to loop back around and dive down into all the supporting components and add a little bit more technical meat to the discussion. Then we're gonna go back and put it all together and figure out how we can build these blocks to uh, actually give us something useful. And then we'll finally come to some conclusions and figure out what we actually learned today, if anything. So for this initial section, we're gonna go ahead and uh, do an introduction to AnyCast. I'm gonna put a definition up here on the screen. Then we're gonna walk through um, looking at what, any cast, what makes AnyCast traffic special and then kind of look at what a example traffic flow looks like in an AnyCast environment. So this is um, the Wikipedia definition of AnyCast, which is a good place to start as any. And that says that AnyCast is a network addressing and routing methodology, not a protocol, that's an important distinction, in which datagrams from a single sender are routed to the topologically nearest node in a group of potential receivers, though it may be sent to several nodes, all identified by the same destination address. So to realize what that means in practice, let's first go ahead and take a look at um, something much more basic and then we'll build upon that. So this is a, a typical unicast traffic pattern in a routed IP network. Um, when client zero wants to send traffic to server zero, it has essentially one path it can possibly take. And that path consists of two hops, a hop from client zero to router zero, and then a hop from router zero to server zero. Now, this slightly more complex diagram um, adds a couple of additional routers and servers to the mix, but it's still relatively straightforward. Client zero can reach any of these servers in a, in a pretty straightforward way with unicast traffic. Now, that's all good and well, but what if all of these servers are running identical services, which is often the case in an HA scenario? 
Furthermore, what if we want to abstract away the need for a client to actually understand the underlying service topology, which is actually what we want? Um, traditional HA methods, for example, load balancers, cluster managers, do this through the use of something like a VIP. Um, but and again, in the interest of presenting some additional options for us today, I want to show how Anycast can also solve this problem. So we'll go ahead and throw that into the mix. So th the first thing we're going to do um, is um, go ahead and provision our Anycast address on top of our servers. So we're going to do this using a virtual interface in the form of a loopback interface. Again, not a physical interface, but a virtual interface. Now, through the use of software, which we will dive into more detail later, these nodes will advertise their address to the routing infrastructure. And essentially, this advertisement is an assertion that I, server zero, can service requests destined for my Anycast IP, which is 10.10.10.10 in this case. Now, the server will talk to the routers, and those routers will propagate that information through the rest of the routing topology, which essentially allows us to build a map of the underlying network. Now, when client zero sends traffic destined for Anycast address, the process is a little bit different. Um, the packets will egress from client one, they'll reach router zero. But now the router says, I have three different ways I can reach my destinations. I can take one hop from router zero to server zero. I can take two hops from router zero to router one to server one. Or I could take three hops from router zero to router one to router two to server two. In this scenario, one hop is the shortest path available for our data to take. Therefore, this is the path the traffic will follow. This is what m is meant when we talk about sending data to the topologically nearest node. So this is an interesting model, um, and one that is used very commonly, and um, you know, a very good one for any cast. But I'm actually interested in applying this in a slightly different way. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So we still have our single client. We still have three servers. But now all of them are directly connected to router zero. As with before, Anycast address is still being advertised from the clients, the servers in this case, or I'm sorry, from the servers in this case to the router. And this is again going to allow our routers to build the appropriate topology map, understanding where our Anycast IP address is. So this time, when client zero initiates traffic to our Anycast address, the packets egress from client zero, come into router zero, and router zero says, well, I still have three ways to get there, but they look a little bit different. I have a single hop from router zero to server zero, a single hop from router zero to server one, and a single hop from router zero to server two. So we now have what we'll call three different equal cost routes to get to our address. Using a technology called equal cost multipathing, which is something, again, I'll talk about more later, um, the router will then go ahead and load balance this data or these packets across the equal cost routes. Um, in this model, as data comes into router zero, destined for the Anycast address, the first packet would go to server zero, the second to server one, the third to server two, and so on. In this way, we've achieved a really basic layer three load balancing. So now let's go ahead and um, move into talking about some supporting components. So up until this point, I've moved a bit fast over some really essential technical details and terminology, and I want to dig into that now. Um, I'm trying to assume a really minimal uh, working knowledge of networks. Um, we're obviously not all network engineers. So I'll go ahead and start with some fundamental concepts and then work our way up in complexity. I want to make sure we're all working with the same definition so we arrive at the same place. So the, the first thing I just want to level set on is a network. And in my world, a network is a collection of nodes, which are computers in this case, and links which allow those nodes to exchange data. Okay? A packet is simply a structured unit of data carried by a network. A router is a networking device which is responsible for moving packets between networks. And now, routers employ two primary functions to accomplish this task. The first function that's employed is, unsurprisingly, called routing. Um, routing is the actual act of finding the available paths which packets could take to any known networks, their associated metrics, if any, and then maintaining a record of all that information in something called the routing table. The second method that a router employs is called forwarding. Forwarding is the act of actually moving a packet from one interface 
to the other on its way towards its destination address. The information to decide the appropriate interface, including ports, MAC addresses, metrics, things of that nature, are stored in a data structure called the FIB, or Forwarding Information Base. Part of the data that exists in the FIB is populated by the routing table. An autonomous system is a collection of networks and their associated devices, generally routers, under the control of a particular entity. That can be a corporation, a university, or some similar. Open Shortest Path First. Open Shortest Path First, or SPF, is an implementation of what's called a link state routing protocol. At a high level, this means that each router participating in this OSPF topology builds and maintains its own map of the underlying network, not just its adjacent nodes. So it understands what is happening across the entire network. And that is built by router advertisements from other routers within the same autonomous system. Equal cost multipathing, or ECMP, is a routing strategy whereby packets bound for the same destination can be sent over multiple available best routes. I touched on this earlier when I had the diagram of three servers all connected to the same router. ECMP generally employs a round robin load balancing strategy, which is a really simple strategy, which basically means that as data comes in, the first packet will go over the first equal cost length, the second will go over the second equal cost length, and so on. So if you bought an enterprise grade router in recent memory, this is likely a supported feature. Flow pinning, and again, this is not a network standard terminology because none exists, is a routing strategy whereby packets from a particular source IP and port pair bound for a particular destination IP and port pair will get pinned to the same route. So if I have multiple, um, multiple equal cost routes, this is what allows me to use connection-oriented protocols like HTTP as opposed to just connectionless ones like DNS. Different vendors have different names on this, as I alluded to earlier. For example, it's called per destination load balancing on Cisco devices. It's called, somewhat misleadingly, per packet load balancing on Juniper devices. Again, if you brought an enterprise router in the last five years, um, this is likely supported. And the final piece um, that I want to talk to with regards to our components are Quagga. So Quagga is an open source network routing software suite. What it does is essentially implement various um, routing protocols, such as BGP and OSPF, which we're particularly interested in, on a variety of Unix-like platforms. This is what allows our servers to talk OSPF, even though they're not routers in the traditional sense. So let's go ahead and put all this together and see how we can actually build something that is useful for us. So we'll start with talking about um, bringing up some shiny new nodes, adding our interfaces, installing Quagga, our shared services, OpenStack services, and then we'll look at, see what uh, traffic flows look like and how we can handle failures in this environment. So let's imagine that we've got some shiny new nodes upon which we want to run some highly available API services. Now, we're going to go ahead and provision the interface which will hold our Anycast address. Again, this is a virtual interface in the form of a loopback. Um, in our case, we'll stick with our earlier example and continue to use the 10.10.10.10 example. Now, we'll install and configure Quagga. This is ideally done via some automated process or automation software. That could be Puppet, or that could be something different. The configuration itself is fairly basic and consists of three primary parts. The first is the router ID, and the router ID is how this particular device will represent itself to the rest of the network. The second is the networks which we're advertising. In this case, we're not advertising networks in the traditional sense. We're advertising a single IP address, so that'd be the 10.10.10.10/32 address. Optionally, we can provide authentication information, which will prevent unauthorized actors from either viewing or manipulating our routing topology in some way. Now, we're going to go ahead and bring our shared services into the mix, and generally an OpenStack that'll consist of a database and a message broker. Their configuration is outside the scope of this talk today, um, but it goes without saying that we're doing this in some automated fashion, potentially with Puppet, potentially with something else. So now that we have these prerequisites in place, let's go ahead and bring our OpenStack services into the mix. Again, and not to sound like a broken record, we're doing this in some automated fashion, possibly using an excellent set of Puppet modules that are now part of the OpenStack project, possibly using another one of our uh, friends' solutions. Obviously, much of this is beyond the scope of our talk today, but I want to call out two specific bits, which is, firstly, we want to make sure we configure our services to listen for requests inbound to our Kennycast address, 
not the particular address of one node or another. And secondly, we want to make sure that when we configure our Keystone service catalog, we're configuring it with the Anycast address or a DNS record associated that, with that address. Again, not with the individual node IPs. So now that we got this in place, let's go ahead and take a look at um, what a traffic flow might look like in this scenario. So first, we'll bring client, a client into the picture. We'll call him client zero. Client zero makes a request to our highly available API service, having got the Anycast address from our Keystone service catalog. Packets egress from client zero and arrive at router zero. Router zero conducts a lookup in its forwarding information base and sees that it has three different equal cost ways to get to our destination service. Implementing the equal cost multipathing strategy, which we talked about earlier, it's going to go ahead and pick one of those links to start with and send a packet out that interface. Because of flow pinning, subsequent packets from the same flow, so the same source port, IP and port, same destination IP and port, are going to be bound to the same backend member or same path. Packets arrive at the node. The OpenStack API services accept those packets because they're listening for traffic on our Anycast address. In an ideal world, they will fulfill those requests in the same way, and then they'll send back a response. Now, as we add more clients, we'll begin, and those clients are bringing up and tearing down more sessions and making a request, we'll eventually see a more uniform distribution of traffic across our participating nodes. So, assuming all of these components cooperate and things work in the way that we think we're working, um, we have now have a functional or semi-functional load balancing scenario across our participating nodes. This is great. But now we need to think about what we do when something fails. Remember, it is only a question of when, not if. <laughs> so there are certainly a variety of scenarios we want to protect against. And while we couldn't possibly enumerate them today, or I couldn't possibly know what's relevant for your particular scenario, um, we do have a common mechanism now to help us deal with these scenarios, or these failures. And that mechanism is the loopback interface upon which our Anycast IP address lives. So because each node is actively participating in our OSPF topology and actively talking to our routers, if our interface is brought down, for example, doing something as simple as an IF down, as you can see I've done there on the left node, OSPF daemon, which is supplied by Quagga, becomes immediately aware of this change and withdraws the router advertisement to the router, effectively evicting this particular node from the participating group of any cast servers. Now, this happens fairly quickly generally in less than half a second. If we want to bring a node back into our Anycast group, we do the reverse, for example, with an IF up. Now, once that interface comes back up, again, our OSPF daemon detects that change, detects that it has a new network to advertise to the rest of the world, and does so. This effectively brings our node back into our Anycast group. This also happens very quickly, the same less than half a second or so. So as the state of this interface is pretty easily managed, we can implement a variety of different scenarios here. This could be something as simple as having a local script which runs and checks services and says, if my services aren't running, bring down my interface. It could be something more complex, like a trigger to an event in a monitoring system, or really anything that you want to do, anything that's valid to your use case. The beauty is that because of the simplicity of the mechanism, it's really flexible in what we can do with it. And additionally, if, if a failure creates a situation where we're unable to gracefully bring down this interface, um, OSPF does have some built-in health check mechanisms, which will result in the eviction of this member. Now, that uh, might be a little bit slower process, but again, that's tunable. Again, the beauty is the flexibility. So let's talk about some conclusions today. Um, so the first conclusion I want to say is, or talk about, is that Anycast is a viable option for HA. The, the test that we've run and the confidence in the usage of Anycast in general kind of bears this out. Um, the second conclusion is that there's going to be some special networking capabilities and knowledge that are required to implement this. Um, I see that as an opportunity, maybe less of a challenge. Go talk to your networking guys, bring them into the fold. Um, we're all in this together. 
it introduces some additional troubleshooting considerations. You know, if I have packets that are leaving a client and they're bound for an AnyCast address, that's not so deterministic in telling me where it went through the network. So, you know, you're gonna have to think about that and figure out, you know, what kind of options you have available to keep track of those things. Um, the fourth one is that this has not been tested at large scale. And when I say this, I mean AnyCast as it specifically relates to OpenStack. If you use DNS on the internet, you are using AnyCast today. Um, so again, don't take my word for it. Go and test, go and test. The second conclusion is, again, know the trade-offs. And that's just really a combination of the things we've already covered. You know, do I have the right networking equipment? Do I have the right in-house expertise? Am I comfortable deploying these additional daemons? Does it just make sense for my use case? Again, I can't answer that. And the, the final conclusion, and this is a conclusion that should be on every slide, which is use the right tool for the right job. There are no silver bullets. The goal was just to present an additional option, one to add to your tool belt, and just to make you aware of it. And with that, thank you, and I'll take any questions you might have. Yeah, so the, it seems like you're trying to conceptualize any cost for the API services mm -hmm. from a front-end perspective. I'm assuming you really haven't looked at the back-end services which uh, many of which are active passive. So in terms of, for example, when certain services need to talk to a database, only one of them can be active at a given time, right? Yeah, so, um, I mean, that's, that's obviously an example of use the right tool for the right job. I mean, any, a lot of the OpenStack services fit into, you know, two or three kind of buckets, depending on how you look at them. You have the stateless front-end services, you have stateless services that hang off a message broker, um, you have kind of other, um, you know, Various types of services, but certainly there are some services where this doesn't make sense. You may need a more traditional um, cluster stack like Corusync or Pacemaker or something simpler like Keep Alive D. You know, that's kind of knowing your environment and figuring out the right tool to use at the right level. Yeah, I, I understood. And this goes a good front end way of scaling as well as a chain, you know, which makes sense. Yeah. Additional questions, comments, beratements? <laughs> Yes. Yes. So um, OSPF um, and other uh, routing protocols um, have ability to have health checks. So you know if an advertisement hasn't um, been, you know, I'm not sure if the right terminology is updated or or re-advertised after a certain time period, you have the ability on the routing side to withdraw that advertisement, and that would probably route uh, result in a little bit greater turnover time. Um, I'm guessing, um, but I'm you know. That's tunable, and uh, it's just figuring out kind of what the right value is. So obviously this kind of competes with HA proxy deployments because if you have a hardware load balancer, then of course that's a different uh, issue. So in terms of efficiency, how, how does this look outperform? Have you done any measurements to see what kind of operational efficiencies you get by eliminating HA proxy, let's say? Um, so I have not done performance testing on this setup. Um, anecdotally, um, my usage of any other cast, other AnyCast services have shown that it's highly performant. I mean, you know, routers are good at routing. <laughs> They're good at pushing packets over the wire. And so, you know, if you can bring that logic up into the router, you're really taking advantage of their specialized equipment. Um, I think it was uh, CloudFront had a nice white paper on uh, the performance of their network and their usage of AnyCast, which had a lot more kind of numbers in it in terms of the performance they've seen. This seems like more of um, a replacement for, or an alternative to, to HA proxy rather than an alternative to Pacemaker. And uh, in that great HA talk I just came from by uh, David Vossel, he, one of the questions at the end was like, you know, should we use HA proxy or Pacemaker? And he said, well, why not use both together? They actually a great fit for each other. And it seems maybe that could apply here, that you could still be using Pacemaker to manage the services. Uh, yeah, you know, I think it's, you know, certain set of services are gonna be more stateful, they're gonna require more care and feeding. You know, you're gonna have to put a little more care into them and use something like Pacemaker and Corusync. Um, I think that at last time I looked at it, the OpenStack High Availability Guide was prescribing 
um, the full cluster stack for things like the API services. Um, and so I think that's a little bit overkill, but I absolutely agree with the model. You know, uh, CrowSync and Pacemaker make sense for those services. It might be used in combination with this or HA proxy or kind of whatever you know, that particular service calls for. Yeah, but definitely, I, it's, a, it's a hybrid approach. It's not I, a replacement. I think the argument David was maybe getting at is that, um, you know, okay, something with fencing might be a bit overkill because it's stateless, but you, there's still benefits to having Pacemaker just from the resource management and the um, service ordering point of view and that kind of thing. So maybe there's, there's value in having it alongside. I mean, yeah, sure, it adds complexity, but... Sure. Um, I, I totally believe that. <laughs> Uh, one question, since you said you tried it out in a, presumably a lab environment, mm -hmm. right, in small scale. Um, what, what, was your, what was the end user or the uh, client behavior when you had, a, a, say, a flapping API server, right, or you flapped the API server, where obviously a TCP connection is going to get reset when you move over to a different server, right? Mm -hmm. what, what was the client uh, behavior in that case when it was talking to, say, Cinder API? You're trying to do a you know volume create, and suddenly in the middle of that API call, the server is changed, so a TCP connection gets reset. What 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 happens? What what did you notice? Um, so that um, is you know part of the the testing we're continuing to develop is trying to figure out what all those behaviors are. Um, I. Um, don't necessarily have on the tip of my tongue exactly to reproduce all those scenarios and uh, see what those are, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can, as we go through this process, publish more documentation and, and cool. kind of talk about the, the pragmatic side effects of cool. using something like this. So, I, sorry, I just thought of something else. Um, what would happen if one of the API services uh, hung so they you know, the, the box is still rootable, the, like the network layer is all fine, but the AP, you know, even the API process is still running, but it's just not responsive. Well, I mean, it, it, at that point, it depends on how you're managing that particular node and how you're managing the Anycast interface. So, you know, if, if you're not checking for an unresponsive service, then I imagine that node would hang around and continue to do damage in your, in your infrastructure. However, if you're, if you're building your checks so that you're detecting um, that, unresponsiveness, and then you can, you know, manage that interface in a way that will remove it um, from the network. But again, it's all about kind of what, what checks you've implemented and, and um, what you're looking for. So, so, so there's nothing inherently to say that, like, if the API service goes down, that the Anycast address will be withdrawn, or the, the route advertisement will be withdrawn. It's all about what you implement in terms of your monitoring. Right. And so, so what, what checks have you tested? Um, so, you know, we've started with, uh, you know, the super simple things like, if, if the service is not running, bring down the interface, you know, that type of stuff. We're, we're kind of working on figuring out if we want to, um, you know, get a little bit more complex and, and implement not just like that light layer of sanity checking, but also kind of deep intelligence into, you know, what do I expect to get back? Not just like, you know, is the service up and running? Because that actually doesn't mean a whole lot, you know, in terms of the actual functionality. Right. Uh, I just wanted to say something about uh, large scale. We run uh, some OpenStack service with any case to, uh, across uh, Europe and, uh, um, and North America. Oh, okay. Uh, one and who are you with? I'm sorry, I can't. <laughs> sorry? Uh, what company are you with? I can't see you down there. Uh, 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 I work for OVH, a uh, French oh. company. Okay. Uh, something you have to keep in mind is that internet router don't do flow piding. Mm -hmm. And a uh, routing table on the internet change a lot. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to have a long connection uh, managed uh, on an Anycast IP. So Anycast works perfectly for short connection like Keystone or Horizon. You don't want to put uh, an Anycast IP on Swift, for example. Sure. That's, uh, I appreciate you bringing up that point. Um, and that's one of the specific reasons I highlighted like OSPF over BGP because it's more commonly used like within a geographic site, which is kind of the scenario where we're targeting, not across you know, those distances. So it's definitely a, a good point. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone.